Joining me now, someone who witnessed the arguments at today's hearing firsthand and filed a brief uh, in the case, Kentucky Republican and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Mr. Leader, it's great to see you today. And it was quite a thing to see not only Justice Scalia, Justice Alito coming down on, on President Obama's side, but even Justice Elena Kagan uh, and some of the more liberal justices on the bench raising serious questions about whether this president has overreached in a real way here. Your thoughts on what you saw? Yeah, I'd be surprised if the president doesn't lose here. At the core of this case, even though, as Shannon pointed out, the president can make recess appointments, right. the question was, were we in recess? And uh, we said we were not in recess. And the president said, in effect, I get to decide when you're in recess. And one of the justices made that point today. I, I don't think they're going to be persuaded that the president in the, the, the head of the executive branch gets to determine for the legislative branch when we're in session. Uh, we, we know when we're in recess. We were not in recess. He decided to declare us in recess and make right. the appointment and anyway. I think and now yeah, they'll I figure that out. Well, let me ask you, because the, the, the viewers know that the Democrats came up with, with the idea of these pro former sessions. They came up with it. And then mm -hmm. when, when the Republicans started to do it, they objected to it. Uh, so there's hypocrisy, as there so often is in Washington on both sides. But <laughs> in any event, uh, it didn't look good for their side today. I want to ask you about this, though, because this is one example of, of many that we've been talking about in the news lately about presidential overreach. And yeah. the question is whether, it, it, beyond this case, what is perceived by some as presidential overreach really can be resolved, in your view, by the courts. Well, the courts are not a quick remedy. I mean, th this was done two years ago, and we're just now uh, finally before the Supreme Court. <clears throat> but the president, as you point out, uh, Megan, is sort of routinely deciding which parts of various laws he wants to uh, comply with. Uh, look at Obamacare. Uh, his view is if it's sort of inconvenient, he can say, never mind. That's not the way most of us read the statute. And um, immigration, he's also uh, had a rather expansive view of what current immigration law is. It seems to me <clears throat> the president is busily at work trying to acquire power that he doesn't have. And it really began when he lost the House in 2010. Well, but let and me ask no you longer... about that, because we, we've had lawyers, constitutional lawyers, come on this show and say, yeah. OK, so when that happens, when you have a president who, in your view, or the view of some, is, is out of control in terms of overreach, you, as the lawmaker, really have two meaningful options. Uh, and, that, and, and, and the main one that, that has been used historically is try to impeach him. I mean, is that, is that ever considered as opposed to running into the courts and trying to get them uh, to do it? The other one is to try to defund the president's legislation, yeah. which, of course, you guys have, have tried before. Yeah, defunding is a, is a, a, a less dramatic uh, response. The challenge there is the, the U.S. Senate is in Democratic hands, and they basically, you know, enable the president to do all of these things. And uh, it's very difficult through the funding mechanism to push back against them. Yeah, we've seen He's that. Taken a very, here's you know, my, here's my the, last question. I apologize because we're short yeah. on time. I want to get this in. Um, you, you were... You, you came out with a piece in Politico, uh, and you're mm -hmm. talking about how, you know, the Senate used to be more bipartisan and things would get through. Mm -hmm. And the reason Obamacare is failing in part is because it had no bipartisan support, no Republicans yeah. supported, as a matter of fact. Now, today, tonight, in a piece in The Washington Post, you're getting pushback, um, citing a quote that you, from you in 2010, in which you talked about how you, the Republicans, worked very hard to keep your fingerprints off of certain proposals because you thought... The only way the American people would know a great debate was going on was if the measures were not bipartisan. When you hang the bipartisan tag on right. something, the perception is that the differences have been worked out. Your thoughts on that, because that people are going to use that against you as saying you're yeah. being in trans. You don't want deals done. And that's why the president had to do things like these end arounds. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I said exactly that. And the reason I did was because of the form that it took, a 2,700 page takeover by the federal government of all of American health care was something I didn't think deserved any bipartisan support, and it didn't get it in the end. Uh, but it was because of the form it took, not because we were opposing it for opposition's stake. Uh, they, they wanted to Europeanize the country, and Obamacare is a big step in the direction of doing just that. Not any Republicans were interested in supporting that. Mr. Leader, great, for, for you. Uh, great, great to see you here on the program. We appreciate you coming on. Glad to be with you. All right, see you soon. Coming up, a new government mandate creating some controversy in the classroom. The Department of Justice telling schools to take skin color into consideration before punishing a student. Is that fair? We report you decide next.